All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual Babes and Babies event. I am Andrea Cooley, one of the co-owners of Des Moines Mom, and we are so excited to have you with us tonight. Of course, we would love to celebrate you and your new baby in person, but this is the next best thing. We've had a full day of information and giveaways, and we are excited for the live panel portion. We wanna give a special thank you to Blank Children's Hospital and Unity Point Health for being our presenting sponsor and offering their health professionals to talk with us tonight. I'm gonna to introduce each of them. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at their bios that we had posted. And um, I know a lot of you have already posted questions in the comments there. Um, so we're gonna to touch on some of those questions. And then if you have other things that you think of, you're welcome to add them. And if we don't get to your question um, tonight, um, each, of, each of these ladies has um, agreed to, to go back to those as well after we're done. So I'm gonna start, um, we have Susan Hernandez. She is a certified nurse midwife. We also have Erica Reese, a lactation consultant, and Christine Young, a perinatal mental health therapist. So I'm gonna start with Susan. Um, and the first question is just, what type of services does a midwife provide? Hi, everybody. Um, well, as a midwife, we provide both well woman care, such as GYN care, birth control, annual exams, and then we also provide prenatal care. We also can take care of women for infertility issues or any kind of problem-focused visits. So it's a really broad scope of care, but we do have a certain limited scope of practice that requires us to also have a physician to consult with. And we can um, we have an awesome, awesome team of physicians that we work with um, for consulting. We can consult with them anytime, 24 seven, whether it's a GYN case or if it's something going on with pregnancy. That is great. All right, I think, are you back with us, Christine? Okay, great. Um, Erica, looking at the um, discussion on in the group today, we've had a lot of questions about tongue and lip ties. Um, so just wondering if you can kind of address that topic and how it can impact nursing and what moms can do um, if they find out that their child has one of those. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so tongue and lip ties are a very common problem in nursing and even after breastfeeding. Um, unfortunately, as a lactation consultant, we again have to um, do the visual assessments um, and state the facts, but we cannot diagnose them ourselves. The uh, physicians have to do that. Um, not all tongue and or lip ties actually affect nursing. So it kind of comes to us as a problematic issue. Um, most of the time, every once in a while, we can see them in the hospital and it's talked about between the pediatrician and the families and whatnot, but not always. Um, one of the questions was, what are the different severities and how do they affect and all those type of things. And the best answer I can really give you from my experience so far is that they are all very individualized. Um, and depending on the baby and the mom, anatomy of the breast, the nipple, um, and the, the severity of the tongue or lip tie um, will depend on the effects of the nursing process. It does, it can um, cause pain for the mom. It can cause damage to the mom's nipples if the tongue tie is too severe and causing issues with the latch. Um, later on down the road, or even in the very beginning, and this is how it's caught a lot of the time, is it, one of the major effects is that it can affect the actual transfer of milk, um, mm -hmm. causing moms to have a low milk supply from the very beginning mm -hmm. because baby doesn't pull the milk out. Um, issues like mastitis or clogged ducts can come along with that. Um, infection, obviously, because of damaged nipples and so forth. Um, and then weight loss for the baby or prolonged um, lack of gaining weight. So those are the biggest issues we see um, in the lactation field. Uh, but like I said, the biggest thing is having a good pediatrician that you can talk to openly with about your issues that are going on. Not every baby that has feeding issues has a tongue or lip tie. So mm -hmm. that isn't always the case, which is um, unfortunately not 
very easily looked away from right now because of mm-hmm. how hot the topic is in the breastfeeding community. So um, getting in, getting help, being assessed, having a feeding actually evaluated by a lactation consultant mm-hmm. can be extremely important. And then going from there for um, your physician help is what we would recommend. Great. Thank you. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds like from what Erica is saying that, you know, there isn't a one size fits all solution. So if, if it is something that you think that your, um, your baby might have issues with, you really need to, to talk to your pediatrician to, to go from there. All right, Christine, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about risk factors for postpartum mood and anxiety disorder? And, you know, if a mom feels like I'm just really struggling, what what would kind of the first steps or treatment options be? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, the, the perinatal mood disorders is an umbrella term really encompassing many different types of mental health concerns from depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, or postpartum psychosis. So um, what I always want moms to kind of keep in mind is the first two weeks don't count. Um, The first two weeks, you're really in the baby blues phase of postpartum. And so we don't really assess, um, you'll get a hospital assessment, of course, called the Edinburgh in, in your screening when you get in your discharge, that will kind of give you an idea of where you're at. And so sometimes that can foreshadow women to have issues in week three and beyond. Um, but that's not necessarily something that we want people to like focus on. Um, basically, the risk factors are a lot to do with, you know, history. Um, of mood disorders in general. So if mom is already predisposed to anxiety, just naturally, sometimes we find women that are more perfectionistic or just like things a certain way. Well, being a mom doesn't really mesh with that well. Um, So that can create a lot of issues um, just kind of in the pregnancy even. So women who present in pregnancy are we typically see in third trimester, obviously lovely women like Susan will try to catch them and get them kind of connected before they get delivery and postpartum. So that's a risk factor is, is symptoms in pregnancy, um, mood disorders in the family. Um, there's lots of different things actually I can spend all day talking about this, but those are really big ones that I want people to remember. Uh, you know, family dynamics, military service, mother of multiples, uh, first time moms are actually at higher risk uh, for obvious reasons. Um, You know, it's something just to keep in mind that you need to kind of keep communicating with people about where how you're doing, because, you know, there's a lot of factors at bay. It's not just hormones. It's your own genetics and all that how that all meshes meshes together in the postpartum or the perinatal period is we're trying to move from postpartum depression is a definition mm-hmm. to a perinatal definition of mood disorders. Sure. sure. Thank Hopefully you. That your yeah, I think that's a good, a good overview. Definitely. Sure. All right. We're going to go back to um, Susan. And what would you say is one of the biggest advantages of seeing a midwife versus working with an, um, an OBGYN for, for delivery? Well, I think I would like to answer that more instead of a comparison, just more talking about what Mm -hmm. midwifery has to offer, what midwives have to offer. So, you know, whether you're seeing a midwife for an annual exam, a problem focused visit, or even for postpartum or perinatal depression, um, that's kind of a sacred space, just as Mm -hmm. having a birth is. So one of the biggest things that we as midwives want to do is for you to have that trusting relationship with us. And during your pregnancy care, that's one of important, something important that develops. So during the delivery or if there's issues or during happy times, we can mm-hmm. feel like we have that trusting relationship with each other. We, we do have 15 minute OB slots for return OB visits, which is generally longer than position mm-hmm. slots. But you'll, you'll have the when you go to a midwife, you'll have the opportunity to have a little bit longer time with the actual provider. Um, That's great. And it just has to do with how the schedules are set up. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is that we also provide labor support. So we're with you Mm -hmm. during your 
your um, labor. We may be in there the whole time. We may be in and out. We also balance it on the woman's needs and the family's needs. They may not mm -hmm. want someone in there the whole time with them. And they still will have a labor and delivery nurse as well at the hospital. That's great. I think my personal experience working, you know, I delivered my three kids with uh, with the midwives and, you know, just just highly recommend it. Exactly what you said, just felt like it. there was a personal touch there. Um, you know, I can't I can't speak to working with an OBGYN. And I know there are great um, OBs as well. But I think just having that personal interaction and connection is really important for moms. All right, Erica, um, back to talking about lactation um, services. Uh, if a mom is delivering, um, you know, your experience is at Unity Point Hospitals, what kind of services can they expect, you know, when they're there for those couple of days, right when their baby is born? Sure. Uh, so yes, I am a lactation consultant at Unity Point. So we have at both our hospitals at Methodist West, as well as downtown, um, we have lactation services seven days a week, at least bare minimum eight to four. So um, it's certainly business hours as of right now, but we are trying to expand our team. Mm -hmm. So as that happens, those changes may happen or may not. Um, so we strive to see all of our moms that have shown any interest either in the prenatal mm -hmm. or postnatal phase of their delivery um, of breastfeeding at least once. Um, we do some basic education. We offer to see feedings. Um, we leave a phone number that they can reach us at during their hospital mm -hmm. stay um, to be able to provide for those. The labor and delivery nurses, the mom baby nurses are fantastic and they're very well trained, but, um, you know, they, and they do see at least one feeding per shift or try to as their goal. Um, but we're the ones that are able to do them a little bit more readily and, mm -hmm. uh, throughout the entire feeding versus just partial parts of it. So that's one thing that we're able to do. Um, again, just generalized education, answering questions anywhere from my first had this to, you know, my last experience was this to I'm on these medications, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. We do associate our questions with the pediatricians that are at the hospital. So that can be helpful mm -hmm. as well. Um, if we see any issues or we're concerned about anything hospital at during the hospital stay, we automatically talk to the pediatricians about it as well um, and bring them involved so that it can be followed up outpatient. Um, and then in addition to that, going into outpatient, we have a phone line that is a 24 hour voicemail. Um, I apologize if it rings while I'm in the office, mm -hmm. uh, but you can call and leave questions and we'll get back to you within that same 24 hours um, to answer your questions. We can talk to you on the phone again during those business hours um, for as long as you'd like um, throughout your breastfeeding journey. We talk to moms for from before their baby is delivered until a year plus. Um, and then we have, we're very, very proud of our outpatient services as well. So we have slots Monday through Friday, um, three schedule slots a week, or I'm sorry, a day, three schedule slots a day, typically based on staffing availability, um, that we can see a mom and a baby for an hour at a time and do those um, weighted feedings and individual consults, like I had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. That's great. It sounds like there is a lot of support for moms um, who, who want to breastfeed and, you know, maybe they're having, having problems. Um, so that's great to know that, that you offer those services. Okay, Christine, um, here's a good question. What can moms do while they're pregnant to help, you know, maybe avoid or offset perinatal mood disorders? Um, you know, obviously they're not all avoidable, but, you know, if a mom is maybe anticipating that she might, you know, be prone to that, what are things she can do to kind of prepare? First and foremost, tell your provider, um, just a shout out to Susan here. Uh, be very open with your either OB or midwife about how you're doing so that they can um, be that support and that bridge for you to get to a mental health professional um, because that's a very important intervention timed wise. A lot of women tend to wait until symptoms are severe before they you know, reach out to someone like me or a psychiatrist or um, any other, they go to the ER or psych urgent care. Um, so, to prevent something, um, this is the reason I love perinatal mood disorders is because yeah, you, we could do a lot. We can do more than we can do any other mood, mood disorder ever because we know that there's gonna be a, a event happening. So support, mm -hmm. 
is number one. Um, there's a really great postpartum plans out there. I think um, I think I said Midwest Mom came out with a, a lovely like she's a doula. She's a postpartum doula, and I think she's local here. Um, she has a great book um, that kind of walks moms through. But like joining with your provider, talking about a plan, how that how are they going to know when things are too extreme for them? Because I think this was a question on the. The, the Facebook chat, like, how am I going to know mm -hmm. if, what is normal and what isn't? I'm like, well, you're the only one that knows you're normal. So mm -hmm. no one can really give you a baseline, but you. And so it's, it's kind of a, an individualistic assessment. And that's why your provider is a very key element to distinguishing, okay, I need to talk to somebody. Okay, maybe I'll consider medications or whatever that person's comfortable with, with all the dynamics of breastfeeding and, you know, stigma and X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. So being a, a, an advocate for yourself and talking about things is number one. Number two is also support. Those won't necessarily prevent, but I would like to say probably uh, lessen the intensity of a mood disorder mm -hmm. that maybe you wouldn't have less symptoms and less of an impact and don't have to talk to someone like me. <laughs> that Thank you. I think, I think those are great, are great tips and, you know, just great for, for moms to be thinking about right now, just what their support system will look like um, to not be afraid to admit that, you know, things don't feel normal. Um, and, and then also just to, um, think about right now what kind of their baseline normal is so they have something to compare it to. Absolutely. Okay, Susan, um, a couple of different questions about what kind of services midwives can offer, you know, like if it's a high risk pregnancy, um, if a mom would have to have a C-section, that kind of thing. Um, can you touch on, you know, what the services that midwives will provide for delivery? Sure, of course. Well, we are a hospital-based practice, so we only deliver at Methodist West or Methodist Downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and we are a low-risk, we take care of low-risk women, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you can't have some issues. Like if your diet control, gestational diabetes, mm -hmm. you can certainly stay with us as long as you're meeting the, the parameters that keep you safe. Mm -hmm. um, there's some other issues such as gestational hypertension. So there, it's not that we don't, none of our patients ever have any risk. They do. But if you start getting sick, like severe mm -hmm. preeclampsia, um, or you're, you're, you're developing fetus has like a severe cardiac issue, you know, then you may have to transfer to the physician. So we, mm -hmm. when, if you have to transfer to the position, we help with that. It's not something you have to do by yourself. You're our patient mm -hmm. until you've actually seen them. And um, as far as a C-section, uh, so like I spoke about earlier, we do have a certain limited scope of practice. So like I can't mm -hmm. just perform a cesarean section. Mm -hmm. I can first assist, I can help, but I can't mm -hmm. do it. That's not what I do. Um, sure. So if we needed that, we would consult with the physician and, you know, the whole time we'd be communicating very clearly with the patient. It would never be a surprise to the patient mm -hmm. about what's happening during their labor process. But we would just involve our consulting physician. And a lot of times they're already there in the hospital taking care of their own group of mm -hmm. patients. Um, we would we also consult with them if we need to apply a vacuum or forceps. Mm -hmm. So for for labor itself, most of our patients never see or meet the physician as long as everything is normal. Um, but anytime we need to, we can consult with them. So it's kind of a nice bridge to a, mm -hmm. a more a higher level of care with, that with if if other interventions are needed. Yes, I that's, think that the offers a lot of peace of, of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And it you know it sounds like you have a great relationship with with the physicians in the hospital. And so, you know, if, if the need arise, would arise, it would be a smooth transition. Definitely. We have a medical director that's part of Unity Point, but the day-to-day -day workings with physicians that we have um, is, it's really amazing. We've worked really hard to develop that. And they've also worked hard to help us develop mm -hmm. it and to work together for a team for the, for the best care and optimal care for the patient. Yes, yeah. I think I know personally when I first, you know, told my parents that I was going to 
you know, go with midwife or, you know, their first thought was like, oh, you're not going to deliver at the hospital. There isn't going to be a doctor there if there's an emergency. And that's just not the case anymore. So um, yeah. it's kind of the best of both worlds, like you said. Okay, Erica, um, another breastfeeding question. If a mom is struggling with breastfeeding, um, you know, whether we talked about, you know, if they're struggling with the latch and tongue and lip ties, but, you know, there are plenty of other way, reasons that they could struggle. Um, what are some good resources for her? You know, you mentioned some of the outpatient services, but what are other things that they could um, kind of reach out for? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Again, talking through Unity Point, we have our outpatient services. I know the other hospitals in town that deliver also have services. So if you're worried about that, that is also something you can look into. Um, Website-wise, Unity Point does have a really wonderful educational um, center on um, postpartum in general, but certainly on breastfeeding. We have a lot of information and we're trying to update that actually currently. That's one of our goals um, to make sure that those stay updated. A website that we do refer to a lot is kellymom.com. Um, that is, it has an abundance of information for the postpartum mom, especially in breastfeeding, um, but it actually tweaks in other little areas as well. So um, certainly one that I would safely feel mm -hmm. um, okay uh, promoting. Otherwise, you know, finding your resources among your own family and things like that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But typically, it's something that I didn't know um, when I became a mom. I went to my sister. I went to my mom. They both breastfed babies. Mm -hmm. so you know what they're doing, right? Um, but they're not the professionals. So um, really, we do. We have long, long, long hours of studying to get certified. We have um, any lactation consultant that has gone through certification is probably going to be your best resource, um, mm -hmm. whether you find them through an online chat or through insurances. Some, some insurances have breastfeeding support as well um, or going through the hospital. I think those are typically the best because it can be more specified to what's actually going on in your scenario. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at issues, it's not always one way. Um, it can be multiple things coming at you and causing the problem that is leading to the same problem, but it might not just be one thing. So that's great. Um, sounds like if, if someone is interested in breastfeeding that um, hopefully they are able, able to do it and have a lot of support. Okay, Christine, um, this is an interesting question. Do men ever have perinatal mood disorders? I think you might still be on mute. I don't think I can unmute you. Oh no. Okay, I think we can hear you now. Oh, we lost her. All right, we will we will circle back to Christine in a moment here. Um, I'll ask you another question, Susan. Um, what is the difference between a doula and a midwife? Well, that's a common question that we hear a lot. So a doula is a support person. They are hired by the couple to provide support yeah. during labor. And the doula also may have some uh, visits with them at home too or okay. afterwards. So they are not a health care provider. They don't make management decisions for the patient's care, um, but they do provide support. Okay. So if you had a doula, they may interact with the midwife during the delivery, but it's two very separate. Yes, definitely. Sometimes we talk to the doulas, but they're not, they like, they aren't, they don't have the education to make a decision mm -hmm. whether a patient needs Pitocin or if, if, if we should, you know, give it two more hours or three more hours. Mm -hmm. But they, they, for them, they are a, sort of a go between between the provider and the and the patient. However, I feel as a midwife that most of the time our relationship with our patients is is mm -hmm. already at that point. Sure. But I recommend I recommend doulas. I think they're amazing. I personally had doulas with both of my deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, to have that support for you and your partner is so great. Sure. Thank you. 
All right, Christine, can we unmute? Are you able, it looks like you got muted again. Are you able, okay. Okay, can, we hear you? can you hear me now? Yes. Can you Thank hear me now? Mm-hmm. Okay, it just keeps kicking me out. Not sure why. Um, you were talking about postpartum men. Uh, yes. yes, fathers can have postpartum. Partners can have postpartum. Uh, there's been research to support that men actually do a hormone shift as well as mom. It's not as extreme. You know, women have the huge crash postpartum, mm -hmm. but uh, men can have. You know, it's kind of like that. Like kind of like, you know, two people live together, so they kind of you know, evolve a little bit. And there's been a hormone for men too, because they've been watching you through this whole experience. And so men can experience um, trauma even after witnessing, if it was a traumatic birth for mom, for example, men can get kind of uh, traumatized from that experience because they're very mm -hmm. helpless and watching someone they love go through this experience, you know, but men present very differently. Um, the men in my practice that I've had for postpartum are very kind of withdrawn. They're they're not as engaged in life. They tend to be like more, you know, phone video chatters and, you know, the wives get very angry at them. Um, so, you know, that's typically how they present, you know, rather than okay. just... You know, so it's, it's a little bit of different presentation, but yes, absolutely. Fathers can have postpartum depression as well. Um, and typically you will see it um, in a little bit less engaged manner and, and it will kind of, women will sometimes be more angry at their spouses um, during that time period. So um, it can and also so would the treatment marriage therapy. Be, would the treatment be similar for a man that they would, you know, see some kind of um, counselor or therapist perhaps? They don't really like to seek out uh, someone like me uh, historically. Uh, usually I get the guy coming in because the wife was really upset with them for X, Y, and Z. And then I, I kind of go, hmm, I want to look at you a little bit more. And then we kind of try to get them into counseling or medication. Men typically will want to do medication first route. Um, but you know, it just really depends on the person and how they, how they want to treat this. Um, sure. I mean, this is just my anecdotal experience, but I think sure. it just depends on the, on the guy. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's fair. All right, Erica, I have another question for you. Um, you know, for a new mom, how often should they be nursing their, their newborn, you know, especially right in those first couple of weeks you hear that's, you know, kind of the critical time to establish breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what should they expect? You know, it, every stage is a little bit different. Um, we, and we'll talk about that when you deliver and you will provide you your education. The nurses, again, are wonderful about talking about those things. But essentially, um, my magic, magic number is eight. <laughs> um, babies need to le eat at least eight mm -hmm. times every 24 hours. Moms need to be stimulated at least eight times every mm -hmm. 24 hours. Now, just because the magic number is eight, does not mean that that's all that happens. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's um, 10 to 12 times, and that can be really overwhelming at first. Um, mm -hmm. But the, you know, for the first several months, at least, um, and we, we hand out feeding logs, we encourage getting apps. Um, there's a lot mm -hmm. of good mom and baby apps out there. Hopefully, those may, might have been things that were talked about today. Um, if not, they're really easy to find. Um, but just keeping track of those feedings, um, for the 24 hour period, 24 mm -hmm. to 24 hours. Um, and then wet and dirty diapers is the other thing mm -hmm. too. So you're watching those as well. But, um, it's, it seems like if all you are doing is feeding a baby, <laughs> changing a diaper or eating or sleeping yourself, then you are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> it is a full-time job for sure. Okay. Um, Susan, a question about, um, both midwife's access, um, during delivery, have there been any changes with COVID? Or, you know, I, I imagine a midwife is, is like your doctor, so they're allowed to be in the room. Are doulas always allowed to be in the room um, with? Well, uh, so so as far as who is allowed to be in the room is a definitely a hospital okay. policy, whether, you, whether your provider is a midwife or a physician, so it's the same. Okay. And at Unity Point, we are allowing um, one, the, the, 
spouse or significant other, mm -hmm. um, and then a support person. Okay. So they're allowed to have two. I think the support person, once the delivery is over, they are uh, asked to leave, but the spouse or the significant other can stay. Okay. Um, so, and of course we're doing, you know, COVID testing on everyone that comes in, whether they come into mm -hmm. labor or if they're, or if they're a scheduled induction. Okay. That's, that's good to know, you know, it, and I'm sure, you know, those things could change, but hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just everything is a little bit different right now. That is for sure. Um, Christine, kind of piggybacking on that, have you seen um, just any, any changes or any rise in, you know, in moms struggling with um, perinatal mood disorders, you know, as they are delivering during during these times of where they're you know even more isolated than normal, um, that or even you know as they're pregnant having more anxiety kind of leading up to delivery. Oh, of course, I mean I think I I, I kind of say it like this: like everyone's been touched by this pandemic, and there's no way to not be. Uh, I would say that the isolation, because initially they kind of kept these women very uh, separate from their support system, like grandparents couldn't see babies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think that's is quite as the extreme anymore. Uh, I think the access to services has improved with things like telemedicine. Uh, women really prefer this. I think in my experience, this has been a boon in some ways. They've yeah. had to seek out more online chat rooms and online support groups. So in some ways, it's kind of a give and take process where we've taken away the traditional routes, but we've given them something a little bit more accessible from their house. And so, mm -hmm. so for women, it's been cool. This is awesome. I actually did better. And for some women, who maybe just didn't engage in those types of resources, it's definitely increased their um, increased anxiety and depression and all of that uh, mm -hmm. because you know, we're isolating these women. Like who likes to be isolated? I don't think anybody's doing well with this. So you throw a, a mom who's stressed out and who has had little sleep and then you're just tell her don't talk to anybody and stay in your house. That's gonna mm -hmm. go well. Uh, just. Yeah, absolutely. And the um, the questions about neonates and COVID and, you know, a lot of paranoia out there. Uh, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, CDC doesn't help us very much with their long mm -hmm. list of, well, we don't know yet. And so these women who are just on the edge of an anxiety disorder just pushed right over. <laughs> <laughs> so we just have to keep reining them back and, and keep keep sticking to what we know as facts. And um, hoping they kind of get through on the other side as we all hold on for dear life right now. Sure. I do think that's an excellent point that in some ways, you know, seeking out therapy, it is a little bit easier for new moms that they don't have to leave their home. They can, you know, get, get set up with telemedicine um, and, and not have to, you know, worry about schedules as much and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, there's always some kind of kid in the background that I have in <laughs> sessions and it's actually easier because mom can kind of set them up a little bit better and comfortably mm -hmm. than my office typically. So sure. in some ways it's helped. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is kind of for Erica and Christine. Um, wondering, so, you know, if either you have already struggled with anxiety or depression and are pregnant and have taken um, antidepressants, are there certain ones that are safe for, you know, both pregnancy and breastfeeding? Um, or can you address, you know, some of those things if a, if a mom is, is concerned about um, continuing with, with any kind of medication? Sure. Um, I will say that mm -hmm. very broadly that most, um, most of the time we can not we because we can't mm -hmm. prescribe, but the physicians can find a medication that is safe for both mom and baby. Um, it is extremely important for the mom to take care of her mental mm -hmm. health um, to be able to be successful in breastfeeding. So that is typically um, what we find happens. Mm -hmm. They are able to find something that works for mom and um, is very safe for baby as well. The only thing that I typically tell my moms is if you are started on a medication, um, obviously your physician knows that you're breastfeeding please let the pediatrician know um, mm -hmm. that you're starting on a medication. I know that it sounds kind of HIPAA-ish that you're going to tell somebody else, but whatever you intake into your body, what, mm -hmm. what be it, uh, food, drinks, medication does go to your baby. 
Um, and there are certainly different um, uh, different things that we just want to watch infant monitoring mm-hmm. um, on the long term for those medications. And typically, they're going to be more sleepiness, um, poor feeding, slow weight gain that might not be caught immediately. So it could be several weeks or even months on the medication mm-hmm. that we're starting to see some of these things happen. And they might not be medication related at all, unfortunately. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm a big promoter of everybody knows. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Just so nobody's in the dark. So if baby comes in with an issue, the pediatrician's not wondering, where did this come from? Sure. Um, so that's the one caveat that I have for my moms that are starting on medications mm-hmm. is just make sure the, the pediatricians know too. Absolutely. I'm just going to dovetail on that. And I think Susan could probably chime in here as well as typically, I mean, I don't prescribe medication, but I see a lot of women that are on medication uh, for antidepressants in the SSRI category. We typically it's, it's considered safe. Now there's been new research that's come out that I think is scaring a lot of women relating to, um, you know, the, the after effects of SSRIs um, on labor and delivery, but it, Susan, maybe you can kind of clarify, I think, you know, yeah. having the support here that it, it is a safe thing. We want them to be on it at the same time, mm-hmm. everything that's for, and, and, and everything that you do. So I want to carry Yeah, I would on. like to. Yes, I definitely want to jump in here. Um, so as a midwife, we do manage depression and we do prescribe medication. So SSRIs um, are some of the most common ones that we use. Um, I really see a lot of Lexapro Mm -hmm. and Zoloft being used, also Buspar. Sometimes we had to prescribe a second medication. I think the thing with medications that's important is to understand the process, how long it's going to take, and that it's not something you can just stop taking. If it's Mm -hmm. not working for you, you need to follow up with us. You need to come and talk to me. We can try something else. Or if it's time to consider stopping it, we need to wean down. We can't just stop it. Absolutely. Um, a lot of, yes. And a lot of the concerns that women have, we really have to look at do the do the benefits that weigh the risks. And mom's mm-hmm. mental health pretty much trumps everything. <laughs> um, so most of those side effects that we can see as potentially happening are very are minimal, mm-hmm. but it can take some time for them to show up. So it's good to have continued contact with your pediatrician or the lactation consultant Mm -hmm. if you're seeing a lactation consultant. I also like to bring up that when you don't treat the depression, you know, some women think that they're not taking the medication, they're somehow saving their child from the medication. Mm -hmm. So I'll suffer, like I'm okay, you know, like the, (laughs) the martyr routine, I would like to say, but you're not actually saving your child from the stress because as we know, so much gets transferred, everything we feel, everything we eat, everything, you know, the lactation, you know, everything goes to baby um, when you're mm-hmm. when you're pregnant. And so there's been research that talk about like if a woman is, de- is depressed in the third trimester, how does that affect the fetus? There is research mm-hmm. that it is affecting the fetus. And so, you know, I always like to give that conversation because I have to sell um, medication sometimes because they come to me first sometimes because they don't want to be on medication. But mm-hmm. it's really, it, uh, evidence-based treatment is both therapy and meds. And so if I can kind of, you know, help women understand that it, it has to be treated fully to get that remission mm-hmm. state so that it's not affecting your family, your, your unborn child or your newly born child um, and yourself, of course. So people, I think, always need to get that conversation that you can't just not take the medication and think you're somehow skipping something from the child. Yes. Yeah. No, I think that's really important. And I think, yeah, just the more we normalize those conversations that we we can't be a martyr to our kids, that our health as moms is, is just as important as their health. Because if we aren't aren't healthy and able to to cope with things, then we can't be as as good of a mom as we need to be. So thank well, you. Well and guys. to have that to have that hope that yes, mm-hmm. they're going to feel better. It's going to resolve. They're going to be able to enjoy being a mom, enjoy their their child, I think that's such, such a big, important thing to to really believe mm-hmm. that these issues can be treated and dealt with, but they don't just resolve like the next day, unfortunately. Yes. Yes. Oh, all the way to 12 months postpartum. Yeah. 12 mm-hmm. months. 
people. Twelve. A long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I think that is all of our of our questions that we've had. But before we sign off, um, I just want to open it up um, to each of you. If you have anything else that you wanted to touch on or um, wanted to make sure that that you were able to share. I think we we covered a lot of topics and um, just you know got a lot of great information. Um, so really appreciate um, each of you taking the time and um, just hope that that it was helpful for for the new moms. So if you all um, don't have anything to add, we will call it a night. Thank you, Andrea. And yes, for I'm going to speak for myself. I had a, several um, messages on under my. Uh, profile. So I will make sure I answer each and every one of those um, here tonight. But um, a lot of them are very specific. So my only thing would be, you know, if you have questions about something that's going on, there's a reason for to have those questions. So just seek help, mm -hmm. seek answers. Absolutely. I, I think that's just the overall message. Maybe we can all three kind of get on board mm -hmm. with like, you have to treat every woman as an individual. Like, unfortunately, I, I can't. Oh. <laughs> Darn. We lost her. But no, I, I agree with what Christine was saying that um, as a mom, you're an advocate not only for your kids, but you also need to be an advocate for your for yourself. Um, and to just to know that, that you can ask questions and it's, it's okay to ask questions. There are um, professionals who who want who want to help. So mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> just in time to say goodbye. It kept kicking me off. All right. Like and I feel like this was a little heavy tonight, ladies. So um, just look forward to what you're about to go through if you haven't been through it already. And it is a truly a remarkable experience to become a mom. So just enjoy every minute of it. And don't ever feel like you're not doing it right because there is not one way to do anything. Nope. That's a great way to, to end. Thank you. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye. Thank you.